It's a beautiful winter night here in New England. And if I look due east, I can very quickly find one of my favorite deep sky objects, the Pleiades Star Cluster. It is one of the only deep sky objects that most people can spot just with the naked eye. It typically doesn't even require star hopping to find. Just look in the right direction for us in the Northern Hemisphere right now, that would be east at nightfall, and look for a compact little dipper of stars. And if you're still having trouble finding it, look for Orion's belt, which is a, you know, really evident, and make an imaginary line between Orion's belt and Aldebaran, which is the brightest star in Taurus. And then just keep following that imaginary line until you find the Pleiades. If you have exceptional eyesight and if you, you've allowed your eyes to adapt under a very dark sky, you may see seven or even more stars in the cluster. Here on the east coast of the U.S., typically I see at most six stars. But tonight, instead of just looking at it, which is fun, we're going to photograph it. And we won't just be photographing the stars themselves, but the beautiful blue reflection nebula that is intertwined all around the star cluster. A reflection nebula is literally interstellar dust lit up by starlight. And the Pleiades are very hot B-type stars that shine blue, which is why the Pleiades reflection nebula takes on its characteristic electric blue color, seen here. We will photograph the Pleiades with a stock 10-year-old DSLR, the Canon 60D right here, and a telephoto lens with 200 millimeter focal length. To make this even a bit more fun though, I'm going to show photographing the Pleiades two ways. First, just on a stationary tripod like this with no star tracking, and second, with a popular star tracker called the Skywatcher Star Adventurer. We will compare all aspects of the two ways of photographing the cluster, as well as the final results in a showdown of tracker versus no tracker. Hello, my name is Nico Carver and I'm an astrophotographer. Astrophotography simply means photographing the night sky. And there are many different ways to go about it. Tonight, I'm gonna to go over the steps of photographing the Pleiades in two common ways. First, with just my camera and lens on a fixed tripod. And second, I'm going to add a star tracker device in between the tripod and the tripod's ball head. And this device is going to slowly counteract the Earth's rotation just by slowly moving the camera like this. And this will allow us to shoot longer exposures than we could on a fixed tripod. We're going to capture a total of 30 minutes with each setup, process them the exact same way, and then compare the results at the end, which should be interesting. Before we get started, I just want to very quickly say that this channel is supported by my patrons over on Patreon. If you'd like to join, it starts at just $1 a month, and I truly appreciate all the support that I get over there. We're going to start tonight with an overview by going through just quickly what's the same and what's different about shooting the Pleiades with a star tracker versus without one, just on a tripod. If you don't understand all this terminology now uh, and you're new to astrophotography, don't worry because after this overview, I'm going to explain everything in depth when we go through step by step. Okay, so the first thing in the overview is we need a dark moonless sky. This is really a necessity for a blue reflection nebula. So yes, right now we are shooting from a dark sky location on new moon with both setups. Number two, camera settings. We want raw file format, no noise reductions, no lens corrections, no auto rotate, all of that. Um, any camera settings other than exposure length, we're gonna set the exact same. Number three, polar alignment and balance. This is something we only have to do with the star tracker setup. And these techniques do require a bit of practice and time to get down. I wanna emphasize though, that they are necessary with a tracker. You can't skip them. But I will say the wider your lens, the less accurate you can be with your polar alignment. For instance, if I was using a 24 millimeter lens rather than a 200 millimeter lens, then a rough polar alignment, even with a laser pointer would be fine. But at 200 millimeters, I really want to take my time at the polar scope and get this polar alignment step as precise as I can to get good results with a tracker. Number four, focus. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Focusing on the stars is difficult. It's going to be more difficult than focusing during the day. You can't use autofocus. One thing that makes it a little easier is an inexpensive Bodinov mask, and I'll show that. But focusing is going to be basically the same with both setups. The only thing with the star tracker is you have to be careful when focusing not to bump your tripod and mess up your polar alignment. Number five, exposure length. This is a 
the biggest difference probably. To calculate exposure length with no tracker, with just on a tripod, we're gonna use the NPF rule, which I've talked about in other videos, and that's gonna tell us at 200 millimeters we wanna take one second exposures. With a tracker instead, I usually do tests, and, and I start at around 30 seconds. If 30 seconds looks good, I look at the histogram, I'll just go with that. If I if I push it to one minute and the stars aren't as round, then I'll then I'll back down to 30 seconds. It's 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 more of a, a trial and error process. Okay, and then number six is number of exposures, or we also call these lights. And here again, it's a big difference. When you do deep sky astrophotography, you typically take many exposures of this of the deep sky object and you stack all of these exposures or light frames, uh, same thing, together to bring down the noise. And to make this comparison fair, we're gonna stack enough lights to get to 30 minutes total integration on each setup. But to get there without a tracker at just one second each, it's gonna take about 2000 lights. While to get there with a tracker at 30 seconds each, let's say, it'll only take 60 lights. Number seven, calibration frames, bias darks and flats. If you haven't heard these terms before, don't worry, we're gonna go over exactly what they mean, but we want at least 40 of each kind. These are gonna be the, take them the exact same way with both setups. Um, the only difference is with the tracker, the darks will take a little longer to create because they have to match the length of the lights. And finally, processing, we're gonna do the exact same. So I'm only gonna show it once and then we can compare the results at the end and see if we can see any difference between the tracked results versus the untracked results, given 30 minutes total integration on both. So that was just a quick overview of what this video is. Now I'm gonna jump into each of these eight topics in order and show you how to do them in detail so you can follow along and do this yourself. When they're done the same way with each setup, like calibration frames are gonna be done the same way, then I'm only gonna show it once. But whenever there are differences, I'm gonna show it uh, first with the tracker setup and then with the no tracker setup. And so we can compare and contrast any differences in uh, using these two different systems. The first step in our adventure of photographing the Pleiades is for both setups, we want a dark, moonless, clear sky. And to find such a sky, let's look at some free websites I use um, to plan out my night. The first one is lightpollutionmap.info. And I've pulled it up right here. It gives you a pretty good general idea of where dark skies may be located in your area. So it has a full world map. You can just drag it around. You can zoom in and out. And you can search uh, for your area right up here under search places. It uses satellite data. So this is a particular survey called the World Atlas 2015. That's the default one on here. I typically switch between that one and just whatever the latest survey is. Um, and they give you slightly different colors, but the key thing is that cooler colors like blue and black um, and green are your darker skies and warmer colors like yellow, orange, red, and pink and white are your light polluted skies. And so uh, you can see here, these are cities. This is the city of Boston. This is the city of New York. I live right here in Somerville, Massachusetts. So close to the worst uh, location you can find uh, for light pollution. So what I typically do <clears throat> is I drive a couple hours away from here to a green zone um, or a blue zone if I can to do my astrophotography. One thing I wanna point out is just because a dark site exists near you, so like we could go out here and, and know that we're under a dark sky, doesn't mean that that spot is going to be good for doing astro astronomy because it might be like a forest where when you look up, all you see is the tree branches and leaves. Um, so you need, a, you need to find like a big field or um, overlooking an ocean or something like that where you have a nice horizon. Um, and this can be sort of tough actually. A lot of times though, if you look for parks that have parking lots or uh, fields, like athletic fields, those are good places to go. If you do find a park, so if you zoom in and you find a good park that, to go to that's in a nice dark spot, make sure to call that park ahead and make sure they allow and can give you permission to be there overnight. Um, another strategy other than calling up park departments is ask around at a local astronomy club. So most major 
metropolitan areas have astronomy clubs, and then they may have a spot outside of the city that you could go to, either just places where they've made arrangements with people, or sometimes astronomy clubs will have land that they uh, have for club members. Okay, so that's light pollution. Last thing I'd say about it is, for instance, here where I am in Somerville, if I have my camera pointed this way to the northwest, that's my best um, direction. So any deep sky objects that are over in the northwest will be in a slightly darker sky or substantially darker sky than if I point my camera to the southeast where I'm shooting right into the light dome of the city of Boston. So it's another thing to just, when you're looking at this map, think about the direction that your deep sky object is in the sky as well, and then look and see if there's gonna be something interfering with that. Okay, now, once we found our dark site, we actually have to think about the day that we're gonna, or night that we're gonna go shoot. For a blue reflection nebula, like I mentioned, we want this to be during the new moon phase or when the moon has set behind the horizon. So for, both the new moon phase we can, and for finding out when it's going to be clear, I recommend clearoutside.com. I think this works worldwide, at least it seems to when I type in different um, places up here. And I like it because it does a number of things pretty well. It gives a forecast. I'll talk about the accuracy of that forecast in a minute, but it also just lists the moon phase right here. It does a full week, which I like. And you can quickly scan it to see, you know, green is good, green is when it's supposed to be clear, red is bad, orange is bad. So I can see tonight, if I open this up, tonight it seems that for my location, it's supposed to be clear for the next, you know, or clear-ish for the next four hours, then three hours of clouds, and then another four hours of clear. So we'll see if that actually happens. I just looked outside a moment ago, and I did not think that... Uh, only 14% of the sky was obscured by clouds. I think it was more like 80%. So you have to take these forecasts, these cloud forecasts with a grain of salt. Even the day of, they're often wrong, which is why I usually check multiple different sites. In addition to clearoutside.com, I'm usually checking Meteo Blue. that has this under outdoor and sports. It has a special astronomical seeing forecast, which also gives you a cloud uh, forecast broken up to, into low, mid, and high clouds. So according to Meteo Blue, right now about 76% of the sky is obscured by clouds, which actually is much more accurate to what I just observed. And my only hour of somewhat clear skies is going to be the 10 o'clock hour, according to this one. So um, typically, yeah, I check multiple forecasts. They're never always correct. There's not one that's definitely more correct than the others. Um, I'll just mention one more. I think it's North America only, but it has a really nice interface, astrospheric.com. Yeah, it says for North American astronomers. One thing I like about this one is it has a cloud map, so I can sort of see uh, when the clouds are coming and where they're predicted to go, and that's just sort of nice because I can maybe uh, sort of get an idea for multiple locations I might go to just in one quick glance with this one. If I did want to change the location on this one, you just can either search or you can click on the map and change it. Okay, so three things to look for again are a dark sky, a moonless sky, and a clear sky. And so to find that, we need to look at light pollution maps, we need to look at the moon phase, and we need to look at cloud forecasting. Okay, moving on to camera settings, we're gonna start with the camera's quick menu. And I'm using a Canon 60D, but hopefully you'll be able to follow along with whatever kind of camera you're using. And the quick menu is basically just your commonly used uh, settings. So we have shutter speed, aperture, and ISO up here at the top. And I'm gonna talk about um, how to set the ISO and shutter speed in a little bit later in the video. But in terms of aperture, we just wanna set this to the lowest number possible. The aperture is a fraction, so this means one over 2.8, which means a wider aperture, meaning more light coming into the sensor. And so whenever you have a choice, just make it as low as possible. And generally for this technique, 
we want f4 or lower. So if you have a choice of different lenses and one of them, the minimum is f6.3, but then on another lens, you can go down to f4 or f2.8, choose that at one that has the wider aperture. Okay, other thing we, I'm gonna turn on uh, before we leave is I'm gonna turn on the two second timer um, this is really useful when you're taking test shots so that you can press the shutter button and then it waits two seconds before actually taking the picture so your test shots aren't uh, ruined by vibration. Now, once we actually um, are going to start our sequence of exposures, we would wanna turn this back to just single shooting so that it doesn't add two seconds every time we take a picture. I'm gonna go into the big menu now and the most important setting, camera setting, um, that if you, if you forget about anything else, you wanna make sure this one is set correctly, is you want it set to raw. Um, you don't want to have your, so if it was set to sort of JPEG only, it would look like that, right? Um, that would just be a JPEG. And so if we just shoot JPEG, our calibration isn't going to work. And so we don't get the benefit of calibration frames and we don't get the benefit of the raw file space, um, which gives us more information to work with. So uh, because it's not pre-stretched by a curve within the camera's computer. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and fix this here and just have it set to raw. Basically, every other camera setting is really just about disabling stuff. So I disable the beep, I disable the image review. Now, when you're doing um, some tests, you may wanna keep this on, um, but I, I prefer just to go to playback mode uh, rather than just see the image for a couple seconds. You really wanna be able to go to playback mode and zoom in and all of that. So I don't find image review helpful and it just drains the battery. So I just leave that off any kind of other, you know, reduction, red eye reduction, disable that. Picture style, white balance don't actually matter for shooting raw, but I usually just set the white balance to daylight because it's a question I get often. Um, again, a color space doesn't really matter for shooting raw, but I just have mine set to Adobe RGB. Exposure simulation, I think you want to enable that because that makes the screen um, brighter. Okay, here's an important one, auto rotate, make sure to turn that off. Um, that has screwed some people up because when you're, when the camera is changing position all the times, if it has that auto rotate setting, sometimes it can, that can really screw up because your calibration frames and your lights, uh, your actual pictures of the night sky don't match uh, geometry anymore. And, and I've seen people have issues with that. So I would definitely turn that one off. Format, I'll just mention quickly here, I'm starting with a fresh 64 gigabyte card, um, but if you're not, go. you would wanna make sure to back up the card to your computer or hard drives and then format it so you have a nice fresh slate uh, to go with. Uh, you could do a sensor cleaning before you start, but I would recommend disabling the auto cleaning while you're doing astrophotography. So then if for some reason, you know, you have to change the battery or something, it doesn't change the position of the dust for between your lights and your flats. So I would maybe just uh, clean at the beginning of your session and then just make sure that, that, is, that the auto cleaning is disabled. And my camera is so old that it doesn't have um, different uh, noise reduction options. But if your camera does have um, any kind of noise reduction options, go ahead and turn those off as well. Okay, and that's really it for camera settings. Just disabling most things, um, but making sure that the image quality is set to raw. And then again, in the quick menu, I like to turn on the timer and just familiarize myself with where the shutter speed, the aperture, and the ISO are. Make sure the aperture is set as wide as it will go for your lens. Um, one last thing I'll just mention about the quick menu is sometimes when I'm doing my test exposures, I'll turn this ISO up to as high as it will go because you'll get a brighter image that way. Um, one more thing actually about bright images is uh, if your camera does support changing the brightness of the screen itself, make sure you can turn that screen brightness all the way up, which is gonna help you focus and see stars and things like that when you're doing your test shots. Then um, 
when you actually start your sequence of exposures to save battery life, you can turn the brightness of the screen back down. I don't think my camera has that setting, so I'm just going to mention it here in case your camera does. Okay, next camera setting uh, we have to calculate or find out for our camera is the camera's ISO. And uh, this is something that causes a bit of confusion when you get into deep sky astrophotography. The reason is, is because with daytime photography, ISO is something that's often misunderstood and people uh, basically say falsehoods about it because the, to simplify or because they don't know any better, people often say, well, higher ISOs add noise. And the truth is the higher ISOs aren't adding any noise, but when you go to a higher ISO, uh, you are typically reducing the exposure time. Um, and so you're capturing less light um, and so you're going, but when you're capturing less light, you're going to see more noise. You're going to see more of the camera's, uh, noise patterns. And, uh, so anyways, I don't want to get too much of an aside here, but, uh, basically just what you've learned about ISO is probably wrong. If you think that high ISOs create noise and, um, I'm going to give you my two cents using a source that I trust, which is Bill Claff's Photons to Photos. Um, you go here, you go to the fourth link down, which is the input referred read noise chart. And this plots read noise versus ISO. You click on your camera over here. So I'm going to pick the Canon 60D. And you just find an ISO where this read noise starts to level off. So for me, that would be ISO 1600. I could go up to 3200, which is sort of what I recommend if you're doing uh, astrophotography without a tracker. So basically where it starts leveling off, you can sort of see is around ISO 1600. We don't, we definitely wouldn't want to pick one of these ISOs because the read noise is substantially higher. So for tracked astrophotography, I usually pick the lowest ISO where it really starts leveling off. And for untracked astrophotography or photography just on a fixed tripod, I pick the next one up. So um, in our case, uh, for this test, for the tracked astrophotography, the one that we're doing on the Skywatcher Star Adventure, I'm going to use ISO 1600. And for the untracked astrophotography, the one just on the tripod, I'm going to use ISO 3200. Um, we, we could even go up to 6400, but we wouldn't want to go up to this 12,800. You can see that all of these have these little circles, these filled in circles, but this one has a triangle. And that means that it's a scaled setting. Um, just if you see the triangle, avoid that ISO setting. Um, you want a natural one um, where it's it's just using the camera's uh, natural amplifier and isn't doing any kind of data scaling, which this triangle represents. Okay, um, let me just mention quickly here that one reason to get a newer camera, which you've probably heard, is that they have lower noise, and this is true. Like if I plot the Canon the Canon 90D. Uh, much newer camera, you can see it has substantially lower read noise across the whole ISO range. Um, and Nikon and Sony's often have very low noise as well. And one other thing that's sort of interesting here is you can see with Canon cameras, they have this sort of stair step uh, down until the, until the read noise sort of levels out. While with a Nikon camera with a Sony sensor, it's pretty even all the way across. So with something like that, it's harder, I think, to pick the right ISO value. It's not as uh, clear, you know, where you would where you would pick on this one. Um, but generally, uh, for something like a reflection nebula and stars, if I had a Nikon crop sensor camera that had much more flat um, chart like this. I would pick a quite low ISO setting, maybe like 400 if I was doing tracked, and I would still probably go with 1600 or 3200 for untracked, uh, for just on a tripod. But with this particular camera, the highest I would go is maybe 1600 or 2000, because after that you can see the, the little symbol changes to triangles, which means they're doing some raw data scaling, which is what we want to avoid. So stick with the range where it's in the little circles. And with just on a tripod, you're wanting to go to a higher ISO. And if you have a tracker, um, 
with this camera, I would probably go lower, like ISO 400 to recover more dynamic range. Okay, this has just been a brief um, primer on how to use this site. I'm not going into a lot of depth with this and explaining what read noise is and everything else. Um, but if you have questions, you can always ask them in the comments. Um, this is this site's also cool in that you can compare, uh, you know, different cameras and uh, see how they compare in terms of read noise, which is an important noise term in terms of deep sky astrophotography and cameras. The next thing we're going to talk about is uh, polar alignment and balance, which only applies to the Skywatcher Star Adventure or whatever star tracker you're using. I like to balance first um, and at least get the, the approximate balance, then polar line, and then very carefully put my whole payload back onto the mount because I find that if in balancing, it's very likely that you're going to throw off the polar alignment if you're trying to do too much after you've polar aligned, if this makes sense. Uh, hopefully it will once, once we go through it here. So to balance uh, this mount, we're going to release the RA clutch here. And you can see immediately it starts turning when I release the, R, the right ascension clutch. Um, and I can tell right away that it's camera heavy because the, the camera side up here is falling. See? And then the counterweight side is going up like that. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take the counterweight right here and I'm going to gradually lower it until I find balance. So it seems to be right there. And then I'm just going to make sure that that holds in any direction that I put the camera, and it does. So you can see I can now put the camera and lens anywhere, and it's still balanced. And basically the point of, of balancing like this is so that the, the gears can work a lot smoother as it's just turning this more effortlessly if everything is balanced. If there's a lot of unbalance, then uh, you'll have more slippage and problems. So this is a really important step with star trackers, especially the heavier that your payload up here gets. The closer you get to the payload limit, the more important this is, and also the longer the focal length. If you're working with a wide angle lens, then this balance step wouldn't be quite as important. Okay, now that we have that balance, we want to mark or just remember exactly where this uh, declination bracket is clamped in here, so that after we pull our line, we can very carefully put it back in, not disturb the polar alignment, and don't have to rebalance, which might throw off uh, the polar alignment. So let's go ahead and move on to polar alignment. So to do this, I'm going to go ahead and take out this whole piece here. So I'm going to take out the declination bracket with the counterweight shaft, the counterweight, the camera, the ball head, everything that's on top there. And I've just covered the polar scope with a little piece of tape because I lost the cap that comes with it. Basically, we, we uncover the polar scope here. We take this cap off here so that we can look through the polar scope, which goes right through the axis of the mount. And the first step is we want to find Polaris, and I can see it right there, and I'm going to line up just by actually lifting up my tripod and moving the whole thing. Okay, so now I have the, uh, this mount roughly lined up with Polaris right there. If you're not sure where Polaris is in the night sky, um, you can just use a compass like on your smartphone or if you have a magnetic compass um, and just point, uh, find north and then you should see Polaris. It should be a bright star that's, you know, it's the end star and the little dipper, not too hard to find uh, once you get a little bit used to looking at the constellations. So this is the first step. We're going to visually line it up. Okay, the next step, I'm going to go ahead and set my latitude on the, the base here. So I'm just going to go ahead and loosen this up, and then I can go up and down right here. And so I can set this to our latitude right now, which should be around 43 degrees, and then I can tighten it back up. And so now this is nice and tight, and we're not having any movement uh, that way. Now we might and so, you know, see if I do this, it doesn't actually go up and down. You have to loosen this one, and then you can use this one to do the adjustment. Um, now, we, we're probably going to have to return to this um, adjustment 
when we actually do the polar alignment. Um, the other adjustment I'll just point out right now, since we're right here, when we actually do the polar alignment, is this knob right here. So this is the azimuth, and this is the altitude. And so we're going to, basically you can think of the altitude as up down and the azimuth is left right. And so to use these later, you always have to loosen one and then tighten the other, and that can move it left and right. So if you need to move it, you know, left in the view, you loosen one, you tighten the other, and so forth. It's just a push-pull system against a pin in there. Same thing with this. You, you loosen one and then you can tighten the other. It's a push-pull that way. Okay, so now I'm finally ready to actually look through the scope. Um, and when I'm looking through the scope, I also have open an app that I'm going to look at. And this app tells me, given my location, which it finds using the phone's GPS, and uh, the time of day, it tells me where Polaris should sit in this circle that we see. This is the reticule. So we're going to see the same kind of reticule in the polar scope. And we can see that Polaris, we should position right at around 530, if you think of this as a clock. And so that's where I'm going to aim for when, I, when I'm actually adjusting it. If you don't see Polaris in the view, um, you can just pick up the whole tripod and just, and just readjust until you see it in there. The one other thing I'll say is, for me personally, I like to start with the tracker off because as soon as you turn it on, it will put on a red light in the polar scope. And to me, I find that red light distracting at first. I might turn it on at the very end, but uh, for the most part, I like to do this just um, in the dark. Uh, my eyesight is good enough that I can sort of make out the reticule just from the starlight. But if you might be different, your eyesight might be different, so you might want to turn on the mount and then it will illuminate the, the polar scope with a red light uh, on most trackers and mounts. So I just showed you polar alignment and balance with the tracker setup. And I just want to reiterate here that with the no tracker setup, polar alignment and balance is not applicable or is not a necessary step because with a fixed tripod, there's no need to do it. Um, so that's the end of step three, moving right on to step four. I am just centering up uh, the Pleiades in my live view screen here. And once I have it centered, I'm just moving the ball head to do this on either setup. Um, we can start focusing. And let's start by just trying focusing without any kind of aid. So all, I do, all I've done is turn the um, manual focus switch to manual focus on the lens and I've racked the focus all the way to infinity and then we're going to zoom in on live view on the Pleiades and here's what the stars look like and I can tell these are out of focus uh, if you are new to this you might not know that these are out of focus the the dead giveaway for me here is that they look sort of like donuts with a brighter ring around the edge and then they're more dim in the center and so let me rack focus and you see how it can change change when I'm doing that. And one thing I want you to notice is that when I get into focus here, a lot more stars pop into view also. So these dimmer stars are coming into view as well as the brighter stars are getting a lot more concentrated and have a bright core. And so this is what you're looking for when you're manually focusing with a 10 times uh, zoom in on live view here. Now I just also wanna show you if you do have a Badenov mask, what to look for. So let me put the Badenov mask on the front of the lens. And we're gonna do the same thing here. Um, and basically, it's gonna be hard for me to show in video, but I can see that uh, there is a little X pattern there. Let me go ahead and take a test picture though, and then go into playback mode, and then you can really see the X pattern quite clearly. So here it is, you can see on all the stars there's an X pattern, but it's really evident on the bright stars. And then we just have to remember when, if we do use a Badenov mask to take it back off from the front of the lens before continuing. It's really just an aid for focusing. You don't want to leave it on. Okay. 
to figure out the best exposure time for uh, tracked astrophotography, you have to sort of know the limits of your particular gear. And so if you have a really excellent equatorial mount that's nice and heavy, and you know that you can do five minute long exposures without any star trailing, um, then you might be able to go with five minute exposures and that would work really well. Um, for a star tracker like this, I generally um, am pretty conservative and at 200 millimeters, I would start at somewhere around 30 seconds. And 30 seconds though is plenty to give you nice um, exposures. You can see that we can see nice reflection nebula showing up even in a single 30 second exposure. Um, this is what dark skies gets us. And so I can tell there's gonna be lots of nice detail from this, even in a 30 second exposure. But I can also see that these stars are right on the edge of starting to trail even at 30 seconds. I did go up to 60 seconds and they were starting to trail more. So I know this is the limit of my mount right now. Um, I know that you know some people may not wanna hear this. Some people probably get better results than I do on a star tracker. But it's really just about figuring out for yourself where your limits are with your equipment. Okay, the other rule though that I wanna mention for judging exposure on a tracking system is the histogram rule. And so it's not, it's not so much a rule as just um, a useful tip here. Um, figure out on your camera how to bring up the histogram in playback mode. On my Canon camera, I can press info twice and bring up the histogram like that. And this uh, gives me um, all of the information that's in the picture, all the pixel values, and it charts it on this little uh, graph here. And I can see that that histogram peak is almost at one quarter of the way over. And it has plenty of separation from the left-hand side. That's the most important thing is we don't want it squashed up right on the left-hand side. We want a little bit of separation from the left-hand side. Um, so we're getting away from the noise floor of the camera. The other thing to look at if we hit the info button again is the different color channels. And we can see that all three color channels look pretty healthy there. They're all moved over from the left. Now, uh, typically uh, advice you'll often hear is get this histogram peak one quarter over from the left or one third over or even one half over. And so those are all good too. Um, you'll get plenty of data that way. I'm not convinced that we actually need to get it um, much further over than what I'm showing right now. Um, but one quarter over is, is a good rule of thumb. Um, and so uh, the histogram is really helpful to look at for judging exposure. If, you, if I could get longer exposures and still have nice round stars, I would probably push um, them a little bit further to get this histogram peak about one quarter of the way over from the left. Now, when we stack um, many exposures together, we're gonna recover a lot of dynamic range. And, and um, so you don't have to think that this single exposure is what your final picture is going to look like. Um, because when we bring the noise floor down, we can stretch the image uh, quite a bit more. Okay, enough said, let's look at the NPF rule for untracked exposures. Okay, next we're going to look at how to calculate the shutter speed or exposure time for each light when we are doing untracked astrophotography, just with a tripod. And for this, I recommend the NPF rule. Um, it's available on this free website, um, which uh, from this French um, astronomy society. And the website is in French, but if you're using something like Google Chrome, you can just automatically translate it to English. There's a little thing up here in the address bar to do an auto translation. Or you could probably translate it to whatever language um, you speak. Uh, this website has been updated recently. Um, it makes it a little bit simpler in some ways and harder in other ways. Um, but I'm gonna show the new website uh, just because I don't know how long the old website is going to be available uh, through the Wayback Machine. So with this new website, instead of giving us a full list of different camera models, it only gives us uh, four different choices. So 
If you have a full frame camera, choose full format. If you have a Canon crop sensor camera, you choose Canon APS-C. If you have a crop sensor camera from, from another brand, you choose that. And if you have a micro four thirds camera, you would choose that. And this gives it a general idea of um, the size and pixel size of the camera. So you could probably just go with that. But if you want to be more exact, you can enter in things over here. So uh, let's find out exactly what the pixel size and resolution of the Canon 60D that we're gonna be using is. So I'm just gonna Google Canon 60D pixel size. And one of the first results here is Digicam database. And it tells me right here, pixel pitch, same thing as pixel size is 4.29. Um, or round up to 4.3. And the sensor resolution, I'm gonna use this max image resolution right here. Um, so the width is 5,184 pixels um, because it always goes width by height. Okay, so 4.3 and 5184. So we're gonna enter those in. Perfect, and so now it knows the actual camera data for our camera. So you would just do the same thing, just Google your camera plus pixel size, figure those out from a website like Digicam database. The opening would be the same thing as the aperture. Ours is gonna be 2.8, but you can change this right here. The focal length we're gonna be using is 200 millimeters because that's the focal length of our lens where it says precision of formula, you wanna change it to point stars. Okay, and then we have declination. This is something you'd wanna look up in like a Stellarium or a, a Planetarium app for whatever you're shooting. I'm shooting the Pleiades and I just looked it up in my app on my phone and it says the declination is 24 degrees. Okay, so we have everything entered now and this results part automatically updates. And um, usually what I go for is the full uh, MFN or uh, NPF that for some reason it translates it to MFN, but we want the full NPF rule. Uh, the calculation for is right below right here. And it gives us 0 0.7 seconds. And I always just round up to the full second. So 0 0.7, I'm going to round up to one. Um, if it said 1.5, I would round that up to two. So I just round up and that works well enough for me. I'll just mention briefly here, this calculator is also built into the PhotoPills app. And that app does have a camera database. So you can just quickly find your camera and don't have to find out this information on your own. Um, so that might be an option too, if you want to check out that app, Photo Pills. Next, um, the number of exposures. So for this constrained test, we're going to try to keep these two systems equal in terms of total integration, which just means the total time when you add up all of the different exposures that you take. And so uh, we're gonna do about 30 minutes total integration for each system, for the just the tripod and for the tracker. Um, but 30 minutes is actually a fairly scant integration um, in terms of deep sky astrophotography. Really, uh, you wanna go, f if you have a tracker, I'd recommend, you know, as many hours as you can. Um, you know, the best astrophotographers will typically you know, not even show you an image of theirs unless they've gotten something like 20 hours over multiple nights. I know we're talking about sort of advanced things now, but the point I'm trying to make is the more the better, always, because you can always keep bringing that noise down, which is going to reveal fainter and fainter detail as you bring the noise in the picture down by taking more and more pictures of the same thing. So uh, for this test, we're doing 2000, around 2000, uh, on the tripod and around 60 on the tracker, just so that we can compare, you know, apples to apples, do 30 minutes here, 30 minutes here. Mm -hmm. 
we now want to take calibration frames. So in addition to the light frames, we also want these calibration frames. And we're going to start with dark frames. For dark frames, we want to leave all the settings alone, same ISO, same shutter speed. All we have to do is cover the lens with a lens cap so that no light is hitting the sensor. Now I'm sure many of you are wondering, can't we just take these later on after we go home? The answer is no. These need to be taken at the same temperature as the lights. So you really do need to take them here in the field. But with such short exposures, these are really quick to take. We'll just, we just want 50, so we'll just leave the same setting on the intervalometer, and we're going to do one second each. So we're just going to cover the lens, hit start on the intervalometer, and that's it. Next up is bias frames. You can technically take these anytime, but we might as well take them now. All we want to do is change the shutter speed. I'm going to change it from one second down to as fast as the shutter can go on your camera. For my camera here, that's one eight thousandths of a second. And let's take 75 bias frames. Okay, and last up is flat frames. And it's important to take these very um, soon before or after you take your light frames, because we want everything to be the same in terms of focus and any dust particles on the lens or the sensor. So I wouldn't even recommend turning your camera off if you can help it. We just want to take these as, as soon as possible. To take these, we take the lens cap back off and we point the lens straight up. And I'm gonna rubber band a clean white t-shirt to the lens hood. You want it to be taut with no wrinkles. Then we place a white screen on top. And this can be any pure white screen. If you have an iPad you can set to white or a laptop you can set to white, that will work. If you wanna buy something um, just for this purpose, what I'd recommend is an LED tracing panel. These go for about 30 bucks and they're powered with a USB cable. Um, so whatever you have that produces a white light, just put that on top. And now we're gonna move the shutter speed up and down with the dial here until this exposure meter at the bottom of the screen is telling us we're properly exposed. To check that, we just push the shutter down halfway and I'll tell you right here. So for my particular setup here, it's showing proper middle exposure at 1 40th of a second. So I'm just gonna set my intervalometer to take 50 and hit start. Okay, I'm now on my computer. This is a Windows laptop that I'm using um, so that I can use Deep Sky Stacker. And I've moved my files, both my 60 lights and my calibration files to the computer so I can uh, stack them using Deep Sky Stacker. And I'm just gonna show this once with the tracked results, but the only difference with the untracked results is you would need a lot more um, space on some hard drives um, to do this process. Because if you're doing 2,000 uh, lights and a few hundred calibration frames, that's gonna take up many, many gigabytes of space, and then it's going to take up even uh, more uh, for the process um, because uh, Deep Sky Stacker does use a lot of hard drive space while it's working and puts that all into a temp folder. And so what I do is I use external hard drives um, to manage all of this uh, because a lot of times like on my laptop here, it, it, it has a SSD that's not very big. So I need to use external hard drives to make this process work, especially with the untracked results where I have so many files. Um, but anyways, I've just organized um, my files, copied them off the camera's SD card into these folders, lights, which are, again, the, um, the actual pictures of the night sky, flats, which are the flat frames, which correct dust bunnies and optical problems like vignetting, darks, which match the lights in uh, length and temperature, and bias, which are very, very short dark exposures. And I'm going to be using a free program you can download online um, called Deep Sky Stacker. It is Windows only, but if you are a Mac or Linux user, I'll have future videos in this series which show programs for those systems. Let me find it here, there we go. Okay, and I guess I'm not on the latest version, um, but I doubt much has changed. Um, this is what the interface should look like. If it doesn't look like this, if you're seeing something radically different, um, be aware that Deep Sky Stacker is packaged with another program called Deep Sky Stacker Live for live stacking. So uh, make sure that you're clicked into the regular Deep Sky Stacker. It should say up here, Deep Sky Stacker 4 point something. Um, and it should look just like this. 
Okay, anyways, let's go ahead and start. And you basically just go down this left-hand side um, going through these different commands. The one thing that I like to do um, first before I do any of that is just set up my temporary folder. Um, and I think this is under settings, stacking settings. Yes, here we go. So um, I've, I think I've already actually set it up, but uh, what you would wanna do, and it will remember this setting if you've set it before, is click into settings and then um, it'll say temporary files folder and you just wanna click on these three little dots and tell it where to put the temporary folder. So like I mentioned before, I don't have much space on the computer here. I only have six gigabytes. So the process of stacking would definitely fail. While on my external hard drive, I have 164 gigabytes free. And so I use that as my temporary folder. Okay, with that done, we can now load up our pictures. So we're just gonna go up here into the upper left and click on open picture files. And my folder is on the desktop. And I'm gonna start by bringing in all my lights. So I'm just gonna click on one, press Control A to select all, and then click open. Okay, and it brings in all of our light frames here, um, but if we look right up here in this blue bar, it says light frames zero. And the reason for that is it only registers pictures that are checked. And for some reason, the first time you bring in some picture files, it doesn't check them. So I'm just going to click check all over here on the left. And somehow, I thought I took 60, but it only took in 59. That's okay, close enough. Um, I might have deleted one that was bad or something. Um, so we have 59 light frames. And then we're gonna add our dark files. So we just go down the list here and go into the darks folder and again, Select all, open. And now it starts checking them. So I have 49 dark frames. And then we'll bring in our flats. We're gonna skip over dark flat files, um, so-called. Um, the, these are files that would be darks that match your flat frames, but since our flat frames are very short, and we are using bias frames, we don't, we don't need dark flats. Uh, they, they would be to correct uh, thermal noise in your flat frames if you were using very long darks like with narrowband filters or something like that. So I'm gonna skip over those. I am gonna add bias files though. Control A, click open. Okay, so we have everything loaded up here. About 40 flats, 50 darks, 60 bias, 60 lights, okay. And you know, these numbers don't have to be exactly your numbers, you know, yours may be different. I would just always recommend at least 30 of each calibration file and as many light frames as possible. The other thing we can do is we can just quickly scroll through here and looking over in this far right hand column, I can see that these all are registering as the same size, which is good. If you have any with incorrect geometry, you know, I mean a different size, that might stop the process. Okay, this is all looking good. And I can also see that they're all CR2s, which is the Canon RAW file, which is what we want. Okay, that all looks good. So now we just have to um, check a few settings and then we can start the process and it just does its thing. And then we have a picture at the end. Um, one thing I will point out here is you can uh, look through your files right here and so if you um, haven't already looked through your light frames, I would recommend looking through them and just making sure that they all have fairly round stars um, and that you know there aren't that have, have, have any like huge streaks or you know stars that look really bad um, or clouds or things like that. If you do find any with clouds or anything, you can just uncheck them and then it wouldn't include them in the stacked result. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and click on register checked pictures over here on the left. You can see there's a link right there. And I'm going to click into advanced and click compute the number of detected stars. 
Okay, and it found 2,088 stars. That's perfectly fine. I just wanna show you if we take down the star detection threshold, then it will find more stars. Um, and if we take up the star detection threshold, it will find fewer stars because it will uh, treat uh, smaller little things as noise. Um, and so really it, it anywhere from, you know, a few percent to 20%, it, it really doesn't, um, I can't tell you exactly where to set this, but the point is you want it to be confident that it's finding enough stars. And um, I, I often get the question, well, I, even when I set my you know, threshold to 1%, it says it's only finding three stars. If that's the case, then something went wrong with your capture because it should never uh, have that much trouble finding stars. And it's, the usual problems are um, that you weren't tracking or um, using the NPF rule correctly, so you have stars that aren't round, or you were out of focus and then it can't find the stars because it finds the stars based on their star cores. And if it can't, if they're really out of focus and it can't find those star cores. I'm going to select the best 100% of pictures and stack them because I've already looked through these pictures. And I also want to get as close to a half an hour of data for each uh, setup so we can make this a fair test. I am going to click stack after registering and let's go into the recommended settings and look through these. These all look good. If it was if it was finding anything weird, and then I'm gonna click on stacking parameters and just check this. Oh, this is another thing I, I hear people talk about. Well, why not enable one of these drizzles? It's gonna make the picture bigger. I'm not gonna get into what drizzling is, but I'm gonna say if you, if you don't know about Drizzle, if you haven't read about it, don't check these um, because Drizzle is a specific algorithm that you really need well dithered data for it to work correctly. And so I would not check one of those unless you know what you're doing. Um, okay, and then I just use um, sort of the recommended different stacking parameters through all of these. And uh, one thing I'll note here is it will create an output file in the lights folder called autosave.tiff. You can certainly use that. Um, it's a 32-bit TIFF file. Um, or when you're all done, you can just click save picture to file and save it as a 16-bit TIFF file, uh, which will work with basically any processing software we use after this, like GIMP or Photoshop. Okay, this is all good. I'm gonna go ahead and click OK and click OK again. It will give me a summary of everything. And this all looks good. And it tells me right down here how much space this process will temporarily use, 6.5 gigabytes. Now, keep in mind that is going to be much, much higher with the unstacked process where we're stacking like something like 1800 uh, lights. Um, so <laughs> just keep that in mind that this is one advantage of using a tracker is your file sizes will be a lot more reasonable. Okay, I'm gonna click okay and let it start doing its thing. And so now it's very automated. It goes through all these different steps like creating calibration masters, ma calibrating your light frames, registering your light frames, stacking them. And in, in, in the end, what you have is one calibrated, registered, stacked um, light. Uh, so basically it's, it's all of this stuff, all of these hundreds of uh, pictures um, are used to make one final picture. And then we take that and bring it into the next program. Okay, so we'll let it do its thing and then move on uh, when it's done with that final autosave.tiff, or like I said, you can also save the tiff off as a 16-bit file with this save picture to file command over here. Um, and then we'll bring it into the next program. I've taken our output from Deep Sky Stacker, the 16-bit tiff file, dss.tiff, and I brought it here into Adobe Photoshop. Um, if I go into image mode, I can see that it's RGB color and 16 bits per channel. If you are just using the autosave.tiff, 
you may consider changing it from 32 bits to 16 bits. Um, there's you know some discussion about whether it's better to do this before or after the stretch. In my experience, it doesn't matter too much, but uh, if you are trying to get the very most out of your image, you might want to leave it in 32 bits per channel, do a stretch, and then switch it over to 16 bits. Um, but a lot of things don't work if it's in 32-bit mode, so that's why I recommend, for Photoshop at least, the 16-bit mode, so we can actually see our histograms and things like that. Okay, first thing I want you to do is go ahead and duplicate the layer. So you can see that right now it just says background over here in the layers panel. Go ahead and right click on that and choose duplicate layer. I'm gonna call this new layer first stretch. And then I want you to open up the histograms panel. If you don't see a little histogram um, panel over here on the right side, go ahead and go to window and find histogram to open it up. And then uh, yours will probably look something like this. And I want you to change it to all channels view. So you can see red, green, and blue, just like mine. Okay, next we're gonna start stretching the image. So we're gonna go to image, adjustments, levels. And I'll note here that when you access something from one of Photoshop's menus, like we just did, image adjustments, levels, it will give you the keyboard shortcut right over here. Since I'm on a Mac, um, the keyboard shortcut for levels is Command L. If you're on a Windows computer, it would be Control L. And so L is for levels, and this is just handy. So instead of having to go to the menu each time and finding this, we can just hit Command L or Control L on Windows to bring up the levels. Because we're gonna be opening up this uh, adjustment window a number of times. Okay, here it is. And the first thing that I wanna do is I just want to move um, the values here off the left-hand side. So I'm gonna do that by taking this middle slider, the mid-tone slider, and dragging it well over here, over to the left, and saying, okay. Okay, and now you can see that we have some separation, some of the stars are coming out in the image, and we're just gonna do that same thing one more time. So we're gonna take this and we're gonna move it even further over. Um, we're gonna move that mid-tone slider to the left again and all three channels will get moved out like this. Okay, and I can see that we actually have really nice color balance because the left edge of these three channels is lining up quite nicely. Now you might see up here that there is a bit more blue in the highlights but that is completely natural because we are dealing with a blue reflection nebula. So you don't, you wouldn't want to correct this because this is, is already correct because there's going to be more blue highlights when you're dealing with a blue nebula. So this is quite good. We don't have to do any color balancing. If these were more out of whack though, because you're maybe dealing with more light pollution than, than me, what you would do is when you bring up that levels command, you would just wanna line up the left edge of these three by changing the channel from RGB to any individual channel. And then you can see that you can move the channels around to line them up better um, just by grabbing one channel and moving it relative to the other ones. So we can do some color balancing while stretching. And if you um, are new to this, I'd recommend watching some of my other tutorials uh, where I do a bit more with color balancing. For this data, we don't really need it because um, like I said, it already is well balanced. Okay, I'm gonna continue stretching here. And basically what I'm trying to do is in addition to um, bringing this, this curve over, I'm not really trying to bring it too much further over now, but just widening it. And the way we widen it is by taking the shadow slider and moving it to the right and taking the mid-tone slider and moving that to the left. And every time we do that, we're gonna widen out the curve and stretch the data more. Okay, until we have something like this. And you can see there is lots of really cool dust in this now, uh, in this tracked shot. We'll have to see, we'll have to compare this at the end to the untracked shot, but I'm not so sure if we're gonna get this much um, 
dust away from the central region here. This also looks quite clean, even just for a half an hour of data. Um, and what I mean by clean is there's not a lot of noise. Even when we zoom way in like this, you can see there's not much noise here. Um, it looks really uh, smooth. Okay, so all we've done so far is a stretch and it already looks really nice. Um, but from here, we may want to uh, do some saturation boosts. So we could um, click on this hue slash saturation adjustment layer. And one thing um, about just boosting the saturation globally like this, is you can see it also is boosting the saturation of the sky background. Um, and so it's making the sky background very um, sort of bluish, I guess. Um, and so uh, we could correct that by just bringing up curves and you know, resetting the blue point, uh, the blue's black point. Actually, that worked really well. I didn't expect it to work that well. So this is actually an excellent point. When you're real, when you're working with uh, nice data, with data that is really well captured and done on a tracker. Uh, even simple adjustments like that just work incredibly well. I, I guess I'm, I've gotten used to working with uh, with astrophotography untracked, which is always more difficult in the processing. I might actually just stop right there. That looks really nice. What else could we do here with it? Well, there seems to be maybe a little bit of a green to magenta shift, I've noticed. Um, this dust over here looks a little greenish, and over here the sky looks a little bit too magenta. So let's see if we can do some color correction on that. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring up a selective color adjustment layer. I'm gonna start with my blacks and I'm just going to take a little bit of magenta out of the blacks, which I think, let's turn this off and on. Yeah, I think that corrected, I'm looking mostly looking over here. I know that the dust got really green by doing that, but we're gonna correct that second. So over, looking over here, I think that did help correct that magenta tone. And now I'm gonna go back into that adjustment and I'm going to go into my neutrals and I'm gonna add a little bit of magenta back and just take out a tiny bit of yellow. Okay, I do like that. So uh, here's sort of where I ended up with the neutrals color balancing. You know, it might not need so much. A lot of times I'll back off of these a little bit after. It just needs to be a little brighter now. Sorry, I'm sort of mumbling to myself. Let's see. Okay, so I'm going to go back here into my curves and I'm just going to Add a couple points on this curve to brighten that up. And then I'll go into my blue curve. Okay, do I like what I just did as a whole? I'm gonna go into my history panel and see here. Yes, I do like that. Okay, so I'm actually happy with this image as it looks right now. I might crop it down a little bit, but um, just to make this a fair comparison and because I wanna do the processing the same with both images and I feel that the, the one that I just do on the tripod is going to need it, I'm going to make a starless version of this with Starnet++ and then recombine it with this version, the stars version. Um, so let's do that. So I'm gonna make a new layer from visible. So I'm gonna do Command, Option, Shift, E, or that would be Control, Alt, Shift, E on Windows. It just pastes a new uh, layer um, from exactly what we have here. And I'm just gonna call this Stars. And then I'm gonna save that. I'm gonna go to File, Save As. We want the sRGB color profile. We want to turn off layers so it saves as a copy and I'm going to call it stars.tiff and save it to the desktop. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to Google Starnet++. This is a standalone program that's useful for removing stars from astrophotography. And uh, I'm going to download it from this SourceForge page. And if you go to files up here at the top, 
and then go into version 1.1. They have a nice zip file for each main type of operating system. So since I'm on a Mac, I'm going to download the Mac version. Okay, once that's downloaded, I'm just going to move the entire Starnet macOS folder onto my desktop here and open it up. And then I'm just going to open up this run rgb starnet.sh file with a text editor. And I'm just gonna change these two file names, the first one being the input file. So we called that stars.tiff. And then I'm gonna change the output file to m31 starless.tiff. This number is the stride. And typically I use a lower stride when I'm at a lower focal length and a higher stride when I'm at a higher focal length. Um, it starts at 128, um, but you can go down to 16. I'm gonna change it to 64 for this image. And typically the, the lower the stride number, the longer the process takes. So if you wanted to see what will happen um, if you run it quicker, you can leave it on the default 128. Okay, then I just have to move this stars.tiff into the same directory. Okay, with that shell file edited like this and the stars.tiff file in the same directory, we now just have to run this file uh, from a terminal com uh, command. So I'm just gonna open up terminal and we have to get into this folder. So the command for that is CD for change directory space. And then I'm just gonna drag this folder over and hit enter. And then we just want to run this command, or this, uh, sorry, this shell script, which calls on the actual program. So to run it, all I have to do is just drag it over and hit enter. And it starts running. It gives us a little information about the file. Um, it tells us how many different tiles it's gonna break it, the image up into to analyze. That's um, what the stride number is. So the, lower the stride number, the more tiles it will break the image up into and then the longer it'll take. Um, and then it gives us a percentage finished. So this will take some time, um, probably 20, 30 minutes on my laptop with an image this size. Starnet++ is finished and I just brought in the starless result here back into Photoshop. So now we have two different files. We have the stars file and the starless file, right? And so um, I'm going to go ahead and clean this up a little bit. And what I mean by that is sometimes these dark spots where it removed the bigger stars can pr um, pose problems later on. So what I usually do is I just grab my spot healing brush tool and make it about the same size as the uh, the dark spot. And this will just usually um, either uh, get rid of them completely or just brighten them up a little bit so they won't be as noticeable once we add back in the stars. Now, you wanna be careful when you're doing this not to mess up the nebulosity too much. Um, so you wouldn't want to do it right in here because there's a lot of fine nebulosity in there that could get disturbed if you were to use this. But there's so much detail in here that I don't think that we're gonna notice these artifacts. So I'm just gonna do them, do this in areas where they're away from the main action. And there's different ways actually to clean these up. You could also use the clone stamp, which would be a little bit more, uh, sometimes work a little bit better because you have a little bit more control, but I'm just sort of going for the, the quick and dirty here. Okay, and let's do that one. Okay, then I'm gonna go ahead and just um, do a curve here and just reset the black point on this. Maybe just do a slight S curve like that. Okay, I'm gonna get rid of these guys over here. Probably gonna crop these away anyways, but I'll just grab them anyways. 
Okay, and then uh, this is looking pretty good. The one thing I noticed is that we have a little bit of a gradient where uh, even with the dust, I think that it's a little bit too bright over here. So I'm just going to do another curves layer and just bring it down just a little bit. And then that made this side way too dark. We don't want it to apply to this side. So I'm just gonna draw a gradient right on that curves mask. And I want it to go from black to white, from this side to this side, because I want uh, the curves adjustment to not apply to this side. So this should be black and this should be white, right? And so that just evened it out a little bit. You can see here's before and there's after. Okay, good. And now let's go ahead and copy this. I'm gonna do Command A, Command C, or that would be Control A, Control C on Windows, and Command V, or Control V on Windows to paste it in. So we just took this entire thing, the stars image, selected it with Command A, copied it with Command C, and pasted it onto here with Command V. And then let's go ahead and change the blend mode. And we're gonna change it from normal to screen. Okay, and then at this point, I usually zoom in and I look at those bright stars where there were possible artifacts and I see if there's anything left over that looks funky. This looks pretty good. One thing I will note about this tracked result is that it does really bring out the uh, chromatic aberration on this lens, uh, especially probably because I shot wide open. That's all this sort of magenta pinkish halos on the stars. So if you wanted to get rid of that, um, there is a good way. We could go into camera raw filter and under optics, we can raise up this purple amount here. And you can see if I turn this off and on, that's before, see how it's sort of pinkish, and that's after. So that's the easiest way to get rid of it is just go into camera raw filter, optics, defringe, and take away uh, purple, and then click OK. All right, um, what else? I think now the picture is too bright, so let's go ahead and reset the black point again just with another curves. Gonna do something like that. And it looks just a little bit too red in the background. So let me open up that curve again. And I'm just gonna open up my red curve and just bring that over a little bit too. Do the same thing with green. I like it right about there. Okay. So I'm gonna call that done. Um, there is one weird sort of black uh, ridge down here, and I don't know if that is is right or if that's something, some artifact from the sensor or the lens or something, but that looks a little weird to me. Other than that, this looks really cool. I like all of the extended dust and stars, and the star color looks really nice, especially after we got rid of that fringing. I'm going to now try to process my untracked uh, picture uh, from Deep Sky Stacker exactly the same way I did this one. I may find that I have to do something with that picture that will adjust what I did in the processing here. So the final result may not look exactly like this um, when we do the comparison. Don't be alarmed if that's the case. Um, but I'm gonna try to keep these processes as similar uh, as, as I can and then we'll jump into the final comparison. And here we are, the final result. So uh, we have the tracked result on the left and the untracked or fixed tripod result on the right. And these again were both about a half an hour of data. This one, 1800, uh, single exposures at one second each, and this one 60 exposures at 30 seconds each. And so I think this does show that in this 
at least in this extreme example, um, having longer single exposures, uh, even if you get to the same total integration, can be a huge help in resolving uh, finer details and uh, dimmer uh, signals. Um, so all of this really faint nebula and stuff uh, and all these beautiful star colors come through a lot better than they do over here. Even though these were shot under the same sky, again, 30, hour, 30 minutes integration on each. Um, and I think the reason has to do with noise, really, um, because at one second long, you're just really not uh, beating the, the noise of the camera. So you're, you're stuck down in the noise of the camera and you, the, the signal uh, really just never has a, a chance. Um, well, at 30 seconds, you, like when we looked at those histograms, they were, they were off the left-hand side, um, so they weren't down in the noise, and uh, that really just helps in the final result here. Now, if you imagine this is just uh, 30 minutes with a tracker, if we went two hours or three hours or 10 hours, you can just imagine how, how good this would look. Because if we zoom in, you can see there is still quite a bit of noise in both images. Um, you know, they're both pretty noisy. But if we look at the fine details in the Pleiades, see how it comes out quite uh, well over here. Um, this is, you know, the brightest part of the image looks really good, even just with 30 minutes of data here. Well, here you can still just see that a lot of that detail is getting lost in the noise from the camera. Now, one interesting result that I didn't expect is that with the longer uh, sub-exposures, chromatic aberration on the stars, this sort of uh, fringing around the, all the stars, uh, was a lot worse in the uh, version with the tracker. Over here, uh, we don't have, we don't see that uh, chromatic aberration, but on the other hand, the stars are not very colorful compared to this. Um, so I think I would rather have more uh, colorful stars and have to deal with a little bit of that fringing rather than just have stars that are, are a little bit uh, subdued and mostly white. Oh, one last thing that I want to mention is that th I did this crop uh, because this was as much usable frame as I could get out of the untracked result um, because I, you know, was reframing it pretty uh, regularly, about once a minute. Um, but even so, a lot of the frame was not usable due to registration artifacts because when you're reframing, um, you know, the outside of the, the outer parts of the picture don't get nearly as much uh, data uh, as the inner, as the center. And so, but with the tracked result, I could actually have done a much bigger um, crop than this, and I probably would have. I'll show that now. So I do like this close crop, but I probably would go for a little bit bigger crop on this one. Okay, this has been Nico Carver from nebulaphotos.com. I will just mention again that I do have a Patreon. You can support me in a number of ways. You can subscribe to the channel, you know, watch the videos, like and comment. But you can also, if you want to support me financially, um, I have uh, some links down in the description, including my Patreon link where you can set up a monthly or yearly donation. And you're about to see all of my patrons' names over on Patreon. They're in the credits of any long video. And I really do appreciate all of the support that they give me because it allows me to make cool uh, videos like this one that do take a lot of time to make. All right, till next time, this has been Nico Carver, Clear Skies. Mm -hmm.